Hello, this is uh, Chaitali Bhav from European Bureau of Aviation and Defense Universe based out of Cyprus. And ADU is continuing with its countdown to the 89th Indian Air Force Day. As the Indian Air Force formidable inventory uh, keeps growing and the metallic birds are flying in the Hindon skies, rehearsing for the flying display of for 8th October, today we have with us Air Vice Marshal Manmohan Bahadur a veteran who is one of the most popular defense analysts in India. To discuss the status and developments of the force we all love, the Indian Air Force. Sir, welcome to ADU's chat room. And now I request editor Sangeeta Saxena to carry forward the discussion from here. Thank you, Shikha. Good morning, Bada, sir. Wonderful to have you on the show. And, uh, you know, we've been waiting waiting for just the right opportunity when we get to know everything from the horse's mouth. We are here, the countdown to the 90th has begun day after we had the 89th Air Force Day. And you know, the truth is that uh, we have a formidable Air Force, like uh, Chaitani said. We would like to absolutely believe that we are the best in the world. But the truth is that when we talk about a wish list and when we talk about needs, when we talk about requirements, we also talk about the existing status. We are here to discuss all that with you, sir, but today we begin with a very happy day on a very happy note that today is the day when Indian Air Force landed on the Siachen Glacier. And for our viewers, you know, it'll be just wonderful to let everyone know that we have the man himself here he was the first to land on the glacier from the Indian Air Force and the first to be known as a Siachen pioneer. So we take off from here. Uh, thank you, Sangeeta Ji, for calling me. And uh, actually today, uh, the 6th of October, 1978, uh, was the first landing. I was privileged, honored actually, to be the co-pilot uh, to my flight command, Scandinavian ML Moga. Uh, we were, we used to have a single Chetak helicopter detachment at uh, Leh from Jam. Our unit was in Jammu, 114HU. And uh, Colonel Narendra Kumar's expedition had gone up in 78. That was the first expedition to show our flag, to oppose the cartographic aggression of Pakistan. So uh, there was a casualty evacuation. And on 6th of October, as I said, uh, we landed at a place slightly north of where Kumar Post now is, Kumar, named after Colonel Kumar and picked out two casualties. And that was from 15,500 feet at approximately two o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, we had 300 liters of fuel and a tremendous landing carried out by Storm Data Moga. I just happened to be there. Uh, that's why I've written about it, but I feel privileged to have been part of the mission. But that's wonderful, sir, actually. And, uh, you know, to have you with us and you telling us yourself about all that happened, it will be a wonderful story to have on some day when we talk just about the Siachen Pirates. And we'll do it very soon, sir. So continuing with this, uh, you know, we've just had a change of guard at the Vayu Bhavan. And uh, the new chief yesterday took his first press conference uh, as a run-up to the Air Force Day. And in the, on the conference, you know, he said something which we journalists did not like to, you know, actually listen, but we have to. He said, you know, we were hopeful that we'll have a chief now saying that it's going to be 42 squadrons very soon. But then he said, no, for the next 10 to 15 years, the question will not be, will not, there's not going to be no 42 squadrons. He eventually made it a calculation and the mathematics said, said uh, 35. Now, sir, is that a good scenario for the Indian Air Force? No, that's a fact that the chief spoke the realities of on ground. And I'm sure uh, the air headquarters has been projecting this to the government and the government also knows. Uh, you can't build, uh, you know, one quarter more squadrons that, that uh, the Air Force now has. Um, the, the mix up phasing out the four squadrons, the 29s will go, the Jaguars will go, the Mirages will go. Now what will come in depends on HA. It depends on the work culture of HA. They are hard they are hardly able to produce eight aircraft per year. Tejas. Mark 1A is yet to fly as a, as a composite uh, package. That's happening next year. And then 83 will come as and when the production starts. 
we've got to hit 16 sometime down the line. If it is three years or four years down the line that HAL hits 16 aircraft, we are talking of 10 years already. So that is why uh, the chief also mentioned that we would like to get that 114 multi-role fighter aircraft project also through because those numbers are important to build up. We already know that we are going in for uh, uh, the additional MiG-29s available in Russia and some Sukhoi is also from Russia. That's what the media said. These numbers are required and that's all fact will be factored in to get to 35. So 42 was out of the question uh, and it's good that somebody has spoken about it. Very nice, sir. And actually, uh, in addition to that, he, he was very happy about the AMCA. Do you think that's a very optimistic project and we should open all our hopes on it? All our hopes are actually on DRDO and HA. Uh, the Air Force has put all its eggs in the basket of DRDO and HA. Both of them have to perform in terms of quality and timelines. Timeline is so important because you can't hang on to the mix and the Minajis and, and the mix 29 slit beyond a certain point of time. So with the arm car supposed to roll out, uh, roll out means uh, the, the, the ground prototype coming up in some three, four years or some date timeline has been given. Uh, right from now, it will not be before 10 years that you can, you would, I personally feel the prototype would be flying, the AMCA prototype. But before that, the Tejas Mark II is also on the line. Uh, that Tejas Mark II is a twin engine, one, which is a new design, totally. So a lot of things have been promised by HAL and DRDO. They have to meet those timelines. Otherwise, we are in grief and we will have to go back for imports. That is the reality. And the sooner uh, the government turns the screws on uh, our R&D, get the private sector in. So much money has gone into the RDO research money. I see no reason why certain research money cannot be given to private players. And while we are at it, it's good to see a second line of aircraft, uh, albeit it's a transport aircraft, the C-295 start. You got to get a, a second line of fighters also going in. Otherwise, to expect HL only to do it is a problem. So 114, sir, I think uh, is going to be a Make in India project altogether and hopefully goes to a private sector, goes to the private sector. And uh, in addition to that, sir, uh, uh, we also have, you are a, you know, basically a chopper pilot. And we'd like to understand from you, is our need over now that we have a passage, we have Chinooks, we've got uh, the Russians from the background. So is the need over? Are we very stealthy and absolutely full of what we require? Uh, two parts to the question. When you come to uh, the logistic support aircraft, uh, with the LUH coming up and the media just says that we are going to get some six very soon. Six. Uh, six very soon and hopefully once again um, HAL has to step on the gas for its production for LUH to replace the Chetak Chita. The uh, Kamov 226 is still some distance away. Uh, I believe the technical evaluation committee is uh, sort of evaluating it. That means it's still far away. I personally would like to see the LUH uh, come in in a big way and for that, HAL must diversify and start a second line, transfer the technology maybe to a private plane so that numbers required at the rate that they are required to replace the Chita Chita uh, The twin engine, the medium lift helicopters, uh, we are very well off right now with the Mi-17 V-5s coming in. But once again, 10 years down the line, these aircraft will be following you for overalls, major overalls. What then? There is talk of IMR HAL. But IMRH was something that I dealt with when I was in service approximately a decade back. So that Indian multi-role helicopter. So uh, though that is on the, but presently and certainly for the next eight odd years or 10 years, we are okay with the logistics of it. But when it comes to the attack helicopters, uh, the ALH uh, Mark IV, and the, or, and the WSI. They are armed helicopters. 
cannot accept me at the end. So it's the LCH, which, uh, which is there, which should be procured in large numbers. The LCH can deliver armament at altitudes of 15,000 feet and maybe more, uh, which no other aircraft in the world can do. It will be in the lighter category, not like the Apache, but that is something we need to develop and get more into the Apache. Right, sir. Sir, uh, you know, is it wise uh, to put all eggs in the same basket and then wait for them to hatch? Uh, that's a governmental decision because uh, uh, in the long run, that is the way out. Certainly. We can't make everything. I can assure you that the next 20 odd years, we will never get an engine. Uh, leave aside a fighter engine, a uh, helicopter engine also, or a transport aircraft. Engine is a different class. You can make a rocket. You can go to the moon. But to get engine technology, jet engine technology, is a different kettle of fish. The Chinese have still not been able to get it for their J-20. And they're using the Russian engines. Uh, they have just about managed or are going to manage for their Y-20 transport engine. The WS-20, uh, which is going to come up on the Y-20. Uh, otherwise, they are also flying with the D-30 uh, IL-76 engines from Russia. But they have reached there because there are prototypes flying with all four of the Chinese indigenous engines. Fighters, not good. So that's a totally different ball game when you come to aero engines. So you can't make all aero engines. Our planning should be that we have strategic ties with countries who can give us those engines and then go ahead with our programs, our aircraft and helicopter. Right, so sir, uh, continuing with that, uh, we wanted to understand that, uh, you know, as far as we know, that Air Force is, yeah, as far as communication goes, is the best out of all the forces, if I might say so. And uh, do you think something is required to make it state of the art, or are we actually state of the art? Uh, no, we, we require much more, because for the simple reason that uh, uh, the secrecy, the you know, our RT is not secure, uh, radio telecom. You know? And in fact, uh, if you remember the, uh, the, the 27th Feb, uh, the day after Abhinandan was shut down, or the day he was shut down, there were news reports to say that our aircraft were jammed because we did not have secure RT. I'm given to understand that the software defined radios, which are a major part of this, have come in and have been integrated or are being integrated. So we are in the way of getting secure uh, radio telecommunications, uh, RT, as far as the airborne and the ground segments are concerned. Uh, finally, everything gets on to uh, technology. Uh, we talk a lot about India being a technological hub. The point is, we need to get aviation, get aviation grade um, technology. Otherwise, it doesn't go on board again. That's where we have been lacking in these terms. I think we have some distance still to go because even the software defined radios are being important as we, as we speak absolutely. right now. Yes, absolutely. Also, uh, sir, in addition to this, uh, we have some of the latest technologies when it comes to uh, you know, our manufacturing of uh, drones in India. We do have them. That's what the government says. But that's what the chief said yesterday also. And uh, how much of drone application, you know, we've had setbacks with the, with the Air Force very recently with Pakistani drones. And we know it's a very important thing that we need this technology. How much of uh, our protection of our assets and protection of the borders are we doing with drones? And uh, is the technology which we have in India availability, is it sufficient or do we need to go out and buy in an emergency situation? Uh, so what, what do you feel about it? So you, you had drones uh, under you when you did, uh, with the Air Force. Uh, you know, the drone, the word drones has started uh, getting uh, mixed up in the sense, are we meaning the small water water ones or are we meaning the other ones which have got much more uh, capability, uh, distance, range, endurance. Now, as far as the high altitude, long endurance, medium altitude, long endurance, we are nowhere. The Rustam, which was being made by DRDO, uh, is nowhere on the scene. So we have had to go for the searchers, the herons. And we are still going for the heron TP, 
We are still going for the project Cheetah, which is arming the Herons. And these are Israeli drones, Israeli UAVs. Yes. And we are paying through our nose for this, besides the fact that this is not our technology. Uh, where, so as far as the public sector is concerned, the DRDO or the ADA or the ADE or whoever is making, getting these drones going, they have, they have been actually to be blunt a failure. Right now, we do not have a single DRDO drone uh, in the inventory. As I said, Rustam is no. It's the private players who are actually delivering the goods now. The three services, the police services, the home department, the agricultural ministry, all are now homing on to the private players, the small players, for the smaller types of UAVs, small endurance and things like that. I am reasonably confident that if we pump in some more money into the private, these private players, there are very smart kids out there. And they can actually get, they should be encouraged to get into the medium altitude, long endurance type of units. I do know there are certain firms uh, who have been encouraged. Uh, the Air Force had the Baba Meher Singh competition and some results are expected from there. Some funding would come, but that needs to come fast, really fast. And uh, the chief also spoke a lot about swarm drones yesterday. So how is how are they going to be helpful? Uh, the swarm technology is there with the private place. They have shown it. Uh, in fact, the army is already... We just saw that. Yes. Yeah, they, it was there on the last army day and uh, is there. So actually swarm technology is nothing new now. The point is we must get it for our requirement with the capability, with the military capability and not for, uh, you know, lighting up the sky for a public demonstration. So uh, the technology exists once again, presently with the private place, the young entrepreneurs, and these are the people who need to be encouraged. Swarm technology, uh, unmanned, uh, manned teaming, uh, UCAVs uh, are the thing of the future, which does not mean that the manned aircraft is going to go away. No, it will not. But unmanned capability is going to progress in a very, very big way. The Chinese have really moved far, far ahead of us. And uh, the Pakistanis, I dare say, uh, have, whether they've got it from China or we don't care, but, but they are an adversary. They have a flourishing UAV industry. We have to acknowledge that. So uh, the man and man teaming and you know all those projects which we keep hearing on every Aero India every two years have to now see fruition and uh, something coming into the services. They are the, uh, they will form a major part in any future war. Right, so, uh, now you just spoke of Israel and uh, before that about China. And then, you know, the, uh, we have Chitali, our uh, European and Middle East bureau chief, sitting with us. And she's been waiting for some time to ask you something about you know, how her regions would have better ties with the Indian Air Force. You know, there's a very major, a major Indian diaspora in the region, and they are very keen to know about what the Indian Air Force or the other armed forces also doing with the armed forces of the region. So for uh, the next two questions, sir, I'll hand you over to Chatali. She'll continue from here. Thank you so much, ma'am. So, uh, sir, I would first like to understand what is the relationship Indian Air Force has with the Mediterranean region? And do you think it should plan more joint exercises with the nations here in the Mediterranean region? Uh, historically speaking, if you uh, recollect, when the Marut project was on, uh, the, it was an initial um, project with the Egyptians. We were making the airframes and the Egyptians were to come up with an aero engine. That didn't fructify for various other reasons. Plus, we've had, a, shall I say, a geopolitical connect to all the countries uh, in, in West Asia. Uh, so, uh, having good relations politically uh, because of the diaspora and economic interests is one thing. But as far as military ties are concerned, other than meeting on uh, UN missions or having our troops in UN missions in that area, and there have been many. Uh, I'm afraid we haven't had uh, very many or very few such engagements. We have our defense attaches in all, almost all those countries out there. Uh, with Israel, we have, we have, as everybody knows, a very flourishing uh, 
um, you know, contracts, uh, economic plus military with their industry. So Israel is the, uh, shall I say, the odd country out in which we have a lot of exercise. And this year, uh, the blue flag exercise, the Indian Air Force is going to go to Israel, I think in another three, four months or so. So the Indian Air Force, I read it in the, new, in the media that they are going to go there and take part. So that's a good first step to start off in that area. Uh, with other countries, uh, I see no reason why not, because uh, we have a diaspora as was uh, brought out by uh, Sangeetan. And uh, besides that, uh, they are countries of importance to us economically. And the fact that the Chinese are making, uh, taking a lot of steps out there. Uh, the southern part of the Suez Canal, in that area, they have got the Djibouti port. Uh, they have got a base in Djibouti, rather. And they have a 51% holding in, in, the, in the port at Paris, in, in Greece. So, uh, on both sides of that strategic waterway, they have presence. We've got to increase that. Right. So, so my next question takes to Middle East. Uh, or West Asia, as we Indians prefer to call it, which are the countries Indian Air Force still has to form ties with, uh, which could be beneficial in the current uh, geopolitical scenario? Uh, the Indian Air Force, when you're talking of a uh, long time back, shall I say about 20 years and before, mm -hmm. um, the Iraqi military, we had a lot of people in, in Iraq. We had a uh, uh, good, uh, uh, some little presence in Iran. We had their cadets with us training, flying training. When I did my flying training in 76 in the Air Force Academy, there were Iraqi cadets uh, who were my compatriots. So, uh, the Egyptians are great friends. Um, the Lebanese, same here uh, in the same story. Turkey uh, has been, you know, blowing hot, blowing cold from, from in, in that field. Greece, Cyprus, these are countries that um, uh, we must, shall I, I can't use the word cultivate, but have presence with, mm -hmm. have interactions and more uh, exchange of officers and uh, deputations. Right. So thank you so much, sir. Ma'am, over to you, back to you again. Right. Uh, Adha, sir, now, you know, when we continue, uh, post your little detour, we are going to talk about one thing which I've always been wanting to know, which is uh, air defense systems uh, capability for the Indian Air Force. Uh, the ground-based air defense system is good. Yes. Uh, and, and we have, uh, incidentally, though I talked a lot of, uh, against DRDO sort of, but Bell, uh, the Bharat Electronics Limited, that's been a success story. All our radars are coming from Bell. And in fact, uh, it has been stated by the previous chief that uh, presently our ground-based air defense system is actually uh, all indigenous, all through Bell. Now, they may have been having uh, tie-ups with uh, Israel or other countries, but they are flowing in from Bell. So that's been, radar, ground-based radar has been a success story. Uh, so... Uh, Added to that now is the S-400 coming in this year, which the present chief talked about. That will add a lot of capability to the overall air defense architecture of, of the Air Force, of the nation. But that is only part of the story. A big part is played by the, the airborne element of AWACS and AEWC, AEWNC. AWACS, we are stuck with just three uh, IL-76 based platforms. It is uh, the um, once again, uh, we expect DRDO to take further steps on the indigenous radar, which they have created for the Embraer 145 based uh, Netra aircraft, of which the Air Force has two. Uh, and I think that contract has been signed with the, uh, with the Air India to get six of their Airbuses, uh, which will be modified by Airbus with the radar, but the electronics will be from CAPS, the Center for Airborne Systems, a DRDO organization, a lab. So uh, the airborne element needs to be strengthened because at present the numbers are very few. It will still be a few more years before we get the full architecture of um, the airborne element. The ground architecture is pretty good. 
answer in continuation to this? What about the electronic warfare technology we have with the Indian Air Force? Uh, electronic warfare, uh, I don't know much because as you would understand, uh, it is something which is uh, very closely done. But the fact remains that uh, I think our indigenous electronic warfare systems perform pretty well during that Pakistani strike uh, on the 7th of February. That's what I understand. But we have uh, the CARE, the Center for Artificial Intelligence, et cetera, which are looking into this and where the electronic warfare equipment comes from. Uh, nobody will part with cutting edge technology, especially electronic warfare. That is a very closely guarded secret. So we have to get all our software, our algorithms, including and hardware, indigenous, if you want to make it effective. Right. And uh, continuing with this, we have, uh, you know, our audience has a concept uh, where we are asked this question very often that uh, it's the Indian Air Force which can guard the space. Now, uh, we'd like you to tell us and tell our audience that will Indian Air Force be doing that single-handedly? It will require an ISRO for with, along with it to do it. And how do we do it? I don't know. Uh, the fact remains that um, the uh, air, as a, we are talking about the air defense part, and when we talk of air defense, it is just not the passive part. It is the offensive element, also sort of built in into the whole, into these into such statements. Now, with the number of squadrons we have, it's a tight fit, but it has been practiced, and I'm sure the plans exist. Um, the very fact that the Chinese, after creating all the Halawala year and a half back in northern, uh, northeastern Ladakh. Uh, sort of throttled back and have gone slow. And now we have all the reports of satellite pictures of sudden buildup of their infrastructure, new radar stations, um, airfields being uh, sort of done up with blast pens and other things, shows that they understood that it was the, it would have been the Indian Air Force that would have carried the battle and struck them nice and hard uh, deep into their territory. They were weak there. They're trying to build that up. So, that was actually an acceptance of the fact that uh, our war would be carried into the adversary's territory by the, led by the Indian Air Force. Now, in any future war, it will not just be the Air Force. It has to be a combined effort. There is no doubt about it. So it will be a combined effort of the Army, Navy, and the Air Force. But the air element part, uh, which is uh, a task of the Air Force, as per the Union War Group, uh, is secure. Your, 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 our viewers, your viewers can rest assured on that part. Yeah, and how much of uh, help of ISRO do we require for all this activity? Because there's for a secrecy the, concept and uh, we'd like to understand you, that. You're talking of ISRO, the uh, space. Yes, the okay. space research office. Yeah, yeah, okay. Now, uh, we have been, you know, our space program has been civilian led mm -hmm. and uh, meeting our, the military requirements in between, in patches. Uh, over the last 15 or 20 odd years, that has slowly changed. And uh, like the Navy has its own satellite, the Air Force satellite went up. So a little more effort is, uh, is, is going in now because space uh, uh, is, the, is another dimension by itself where war will happen. And there is space warfare tactics already being talked about. And people have formed space uh, forces, the Americans, uh, the French, uh, the Chinese in, in, in a particular form. Uh, we've formed a space cell, a space agency, sort of a thing, which has just started, I think, two years back, uh, to sort of combine and take the three services along, along with ISRO. So that's going to be the nodal point. And I am sure um, that uh, the emphasis on, on military requirements by ISRO or by the space agency would be met, and they'll be given more uh, credence. Because in any future war, we would like to have, you know, ISR on demand, satellites that can be launched quickly, which can be maneuvered, which can be repositioned. All this would be required uh, because information is, 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 is a currency in war uh, on which you cannot place any value. Right. And when we talk of information, sir, uh, what do you think should be the right methodology uh, if the Indian Air Force should adopt 
when it comes to intelligence coming from various quarters internationally. So do we have some tie-ups with other countries for int gathering and sharing of intelligence? No, I'm sure there is. I mean, there is no two ways about it. And int is just not military. There is open source intelligence. And that's why we have a central agency in Delhi. I think they meet uh, whatever, once a week. Or, I have no idea. But uh, it's in the RAW, the RANW, uh, the IB, and uh, the military intelligence, which, which they meet. Uh, so uh, nothing much is known. But the, the defense attaches are important sources. And then uh, the intelligence gathering system of the nation is something that is, um, we are not privy at least, I am not privy. Uh, but rest assured, I think they are, they are doing their job. The NTRO was set up for technical intelligence. Uh, and that shows that the importance of uh, ISR has been given due credence by the government. Yes. Uh, so now that you know it's going to be uh, two days from now, the Air Force Day 89, we'd like you to add on to whatever you feel that uh, the Air Force uh, is at a stage where it will just you know, now take off to be the best in the world. Now, what, what are these points? What are these things which are required and could be done absolutely without hindrances of timelines? And it could put us, put us uh, on a platform which is best at par with the best of the world. Uh, the first part is uh, technology, etc. We have spoken enough. Uh, yeah. the, important, well, the important factor is the human resource. Because to work the technology, uh, there is the, the correct standard of human resource which is required. And it's just not pilots. It's the technicians, the technical officers, the, the, the logistics flow that has to come in and so many other things that are there. So uh, it is important that the policies of the government attract the right talent into the Air Force and certainly for the Army and Navy too. Uh, we require right people, right sparks who are willing to work the long hours that are required uh, for a satisfaction, which is that the war doesn't happen. If war doesn't happen because of the deterrent factor, then the aim of having the armed forces has succeeded. That's why. Well. So actually, war is a failure of deterrence. Uh, hence, uh, for the Indian Air Force, it is to get the right material of people in, to train them well, to work at the correct level and extract the maximum juice from the high technology um, assets that we have got and that we are going to get. Uh, that is the major task of the HR and the training directorate, training command of the Indian Air Force. The ops staff uh, uh, gets, from, the, gets the inflow and uh, they have their, their work cut out, they have their SOPs and they're doing a fine job. And they also need to continuously adapt to the technology that is happening. So with the Air Force Day coming up uh, two days from now, on the 8th of October, uh, as somebody who's worn the blues for almost 37 years, uh, and if you had uh, a few more years of NDA and Air Force Academy, that's roughly four decades, uh, it's been a life worth, uh, you know, no, no value can be accorded to that. And uh, next life, and wear the blues again if given a chance. Thank you so much, sir. That was just wonderful. And when you ending on such a nice note, we also end on a note saying that, you know, we have been, we are very excited. This is a, uh, you know, virtually an all women's organization. And uh, it was such good news to hear that NDA has now opened its, you know, portals for girls. And the first exam, which is just going to happen a couple of months from now, the forms are being filled and girls are filling in plenty, you know. You know, we've had queries by hundreds on our website how do we fill the form where do we go for it how can our daughters come into India and then go into the Indian Air Force mind it Indian Army Indian Navy Indian Air Force yes but query for Indian Air Force is very strong on our uh, portal sir so we you know end on this real pleasant note that uh, I we are very happy that you know the fact that uh, when people talk about gender bias our armed forces uh, we always feel 
that uh, we, you know, we could have stories, but then, you know, we always feel that no, the gender bias does not exist. It started taking, it takes time to come to a level at the world where world also has, you know, the best of the Army, Navy, Air Forces have women. And now India is coming to the fact that NDA will have, we are coming, we're just going on the right track, I think. Thank you so much, sir, for being with us on our chat room. And uh, now, you know, it's just uh, time for us to say our goodbyes and wish you a very, very happy Air Force Day. So uh, we hope and thank to you. see you again. Thank you, thank you, Sajid. Thank you, Chaitali. Thank you so and much, it's our, and, it's, and it's our Air Force, the nation's Air Force. So happy yes. Air Force Day to you all and to everybody. Right, thank sir. You thank so you much, so sir. much, sir. Thank, thank you, you so Jan. Much, sir. Right. Have Jan. a great day ahead, all of you. Thank you. Bye-bye.